claims of banking misconduct. I spoke earlier with the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, beginning on that point. Josh Frydenberg, thanks for your time. A new plan from Labor today on compensation for victims of banking misconduct. Your thoughts? Imitation is the best form of flattery. It's taken them 18 days to mimic an announcement that we made in our full and comprehensive report to the Hain Royal Commission. Uh, we set up the Australian Financial Complaints Authority. We set up its jurisdiction and its compensation limits based on independent advice from the Ramsey Review, uh, which actually involved people from choice and consumer groups, uh, people from, with experience on the Productivity Commission, people uh, with experience in the law. Uh, we think we've got the balance right mm. uh, and Labor have taken 18 days to come to the same conclusion. So in terms of those compensations, because that's one of the big changes from Labor, uh, you'll have consumers and small business now eligible for up to $2 million in compensation. Previously it was $500,000 for consumers. So if a consumer lost more than that, more than the $500,000, they must prefer Labor's plan. Well, we've got to actually get the balance right. Let's remember that there are 35,000 members of the Australian Financial Compliance Authority. It's not just the big banks that, uh, that uh, Bill Shorten continues to talk about. Now, they meet the compensation payments through levies uh, and as a compensation scheme of last resort. Now, it's important for them to get indemnity insurance uh, and uh, for them to continue to be stable and prosperous businesses. So it's really important that the balance is right, we believe, in a compensation scheme of last resort. That's why we were the first to announce it. We believe that the Australian Financial Compliance Authority is the right avenue for this. That's why we established it. Mm. And now the Labor Party is playing catch up. The compensation for non financial loss at the moment is just $5,000. Why is that so? Well, again, it's about getting the balance right, uh, and we think uh, that we have got the balance right. Compensation is going to be significant, but importantly, we've also uh, extended the remit of the Financial Complaints Authority to go back now a decade consistent with the period uh, of the Hain Royal Commission itself. So people will now get their opportunity for their case to be heard. Mm. The other thing that we announced, Tom, was that we as the government would pick up the tab for $30 million of compensation for, for payments that were never made but were adjudicated under the Financial Ombudsman Service. So we've, okay. we've got a comprehensive response. Yeah, and I know you announced that, going back to 08 earlier in the week, but just one more on that $5,000 cap. What sort of loss are we talking about? Because that's not much money. Well. Let's look at the broader compensation scheme. I do think we've got the balance right. Uh, Labor has been interested in stunts all along mm. here. They demanded that we put out the report straight away so that they could respond within a week, said Claire O'Neill. They said if there was a recommendation from Hayne that it shall be done, was Chris Bowen's words. Uh, we've heard today that they're backflipping on mortgage mm. brokers. I want to get to and, them in, in and, just and, a moment. And, and that is a humiliation I, I get... for, the, for Bowen and for O'Neill. I don't want to get to that in just a moment, but this difference, this is the huge difference between you and Labor. Non-financial loss, $5,000 under your plan, $2 million for Labor. Well, obviously the focus has been on the financial loss, but again, we think we have the balance right. Is there an example of non-financial loss um, that, that you can give? You know, why it's such a small amount? Well, look, it's about getting the balance right. It's financial loss and non-financial loss. They're both provided before by AFCA. Labor's playing follow the leader here. We made these decisions around compensation limits and jurisdiction based on independent advice. And Tom, we've gone back a decade too. Uh, mortgage brokers, which you mentioned, is it fair to say you won't be making customers pay upfront commissions? Well, what we have said is that you've got to be really cautious mm. about this particular recommendation of Hain, particularly because the Productivity Commission itself had actually said if you change that fee model, then the impact on competition could be detrimental, that the big banks could benefit at the expense of the smaller lenders. Mm. Now, mortgage brokers employ around 26,000 people in the community. 75% of them are sole traders, so they're small businesses, and they wrote right over 50% of the mortgages in the residential housing market. Now, Claire O'Neill said on ABC Radio that when it comes to the commissions for mortgage brokers, they should all go. We have never said such a thing. Uh, Chris Bowen said they would implement the recommendations. Uh, again, we did, were very cautious with respect to that. And the Reserve Bank came in behind us and said that our caution was right. Uh, we will do a review in three years' time. Mm. We stand on the side of mortgage brokers. The Labor Party can't be trusted. So in terms of what that actually means, we stand on the side of mortgage brokers. For now, there's going to be a review on those upfront commissions and how they'll work. There's, there's going to be no change 
at all. Well, what, we've said is on be, what we've said is on best interest duty, let's put that in, in accordance with Hain. Let's get rid of the volume based bonuses and we've also uh, got a phase out period for, for the trailing commissions, mm. uh, for new ones. But when it comes to the uh, customer paying a fee instead of the bank paying the mortgage broker, we've exhibited a great deal of caution and we've been backed in the, by the Reserve Bank of Australia. Because you have said several times, and this has been increasingly, I think, a feature of the past two weeks in question time, we've heard you say quite loudly, we're on the side of mortgage brokers. And we are. And so it, in terms of what that actually means, even with the review, you seem to be indicating the upfront commission, the customer, that would never be a good idea for them to pay that. Well, we've got a review in three years' time, but we've said let's not jump to implement uh, that particular recommendation because mm. of what the Productivity Commission and others have said about that particular policy. But that's in stark contrast to what the Labor Party has said. The Labor Party has said, if Hain recommends it, it shall be done, says Chris Bowen. We will implement every single recommendation, said Claire O'Neill. Today, there's egg on their face. As for the trailing commissions, they will be phased out, as you just mentioned. Is there an issue? We said in relation to new trailing commissions. Right, but in, in terms of incentive here, if they get nothing, if mortgage workers get nothing from a trailing commission, they get 100% of their income from uh, commissions each time they write a loan. You're going to incentivise churning, aren't you? Well, no, because it's, it's in the mortgage broker's interest to keep getting someone on a new loan. They get money every single time nothing in the interim. Well actually I think that the mortgage brokers do a very good job of ensuring the best interest of the customer and that's where the best interest duty that Hain actually recommended will also play a role. So they would be prevented from doing that sort of churn even if you know they might be able to get someone on this Well they'll have an obligation, they'll have an obligation right. to continue to act in the best interest. So they could get someone on a fractionally better deal and keep churning them around. Again the best commission. interest duty I think will play its role there. A fractionally better deal is best interest though, right? Well, no. A, f a best interest duty is ensuring that the consumer's interests come first. Mm. But is there an issue with churning on incentive there? Well, look, I think that this will be dealt with within the industry, but I think the focus is on ensuring that we don't change the fee model in haste, which is what the Labor Party was proposing when they first looked at the Hay and Royal Commission. And finally on this, the, there's incentive at the moment to write a bigger loan, obviously. Your commission is commensurate to how big the loan is. Is that a problem? Well, look, I think that obviously the best interest duty will also play a role here. What you want is the mortgage broker, Tom, to get a deal that is in the interest of the consumers. And speaking mm. to consumers and speaking to mortgage brokers, I think that relationship and one of respect has worked well. So the best interest there would ensure they're not getting a loan too big? Well, I think what is going to happen here is that the consumers will be well served by the mortgage brokers, but the big banks won't get actually the additional work that they would have if, they, if the Hain Royal Commission was implemented as was. But on that size of the loan, because one of the issues at the moment with mortgage brokers, they tend to write bigger loans. Well, I think, the you, argument I, th is I, think I don't know if that's actually, you're being accurate there. Mm. Um, there may be some instances where some of the bigger loans uh, may be done and the mortgage broker do get the financial benefit of having those bigger loans, but that also provides the flexibility uh, to the consumer because they can draw down on higher amounts as well. So I think you've got to understand there's a two-way relationship here between the mortgage broker and actually the customer. Mm -hmm. The market has worked uh, effectively well. These people are well respected in our community. We've ex exhibited a great deal of caution. We've followed what the Productivity Commission has, uh, has also recommended here. Um, we've been backed in by the Reserve Bank of Australia. But the real story today is that the Labor Party and Chris Bowen and Claire O'Neill have been forced into a humiliating back down and they've been rolled by their caucus, rolled by their cabinet and rolled by their leader. We'll see what they do on that. They've always got an invitation to come on the program. Well, I noticed that, the, position. that Claire O'Neill hasn't rushed to, to fulfil that invitation for We'll you. see. We'll see. The door's always open. Um, and where to hide today. I wanted to speak to you about frank dividends. Sure. Um, this has been, obviously, a big topic as well. What's your best example of someone's financial situation here that's going to be hit by a Labor's plan that should not be? Well, there's a thousand plus submissions uh, to the parliamentary inquiry, many of which that I read out this week, mm. uh, where people on low incomes uh, are actually going to be hit, Tom, by Labor's uh, new policy, their retirees tax. And it's a $55 billion tax grab. So that's money straight out of the pockets of retirees and people who are preparing for retirement into the coffers of government. Mm. Now, the Labor Party supported this policy for two decades. Simon Cream was very upfront 
and said that actually low income earners and retirees would be the beneficiary. Now over 80 per cent of people who will be hit by Labor's policy have a taxable income under $37,000. Now over half the people who will be affected are women and of those Half of, her, half of them are single or widowed, and two-thirds of whom are over the age of 60. Now, the other thing to point out here is Labor said there's a pensioner's guarantee. Well, that's actually not worth the paper that's written on, and Labor even admits that now. Because anybody who was a pensioner before the 28th of March 2018, but sets up a self-managed super fund after that date, will be hit by Labor's policy. Mm. Anybody who had a self-managed super fund before the 28th of March 2018 and becomes a pensioner after that date, will be hit by Labor's policy. That's around 50,000 people. That, so there that, are facts mm. and there is fiction. And that, the Labor Party's pensioner's guarantee is not worth the paper it's written. Well, going through a few of those elements, obviously self-managed super funds tend to have much bigger balances. But, but I just want to get... Not in every case. Not in see, every case. And but, as you know, there's not a legislated minimum. This is really important. Again, I, this course, is Labor's yes, policy. But, but just on that aspect in terms of um, the incentive, I mean, if someone is a pensioner, they're not really going to set up a self-managed super fund, are they, after that date? Because what happens any if they're pensioner... A what happens if they're a widow? Well, you don't need to set up a self-managed well, No, but what happens fund? if they're a widow and they've actually been left a self-managed super fund, as is, can be often the case if, it, if you're thinking of a, of a, of a widowed um, uh, woman uh, who's been left a self-managed super fund by her husband. I mean, you've got to go through these stories. Mm. You've got to listen into the parliament, Tom. These are people who doesn't necessarily vote Liberal or Labor. These can, are people who are affected. Can I get, I know you spent, talked about, you know, the people can be affected, but what about the specific financial circumstances of where you... Well, they think, each differ in different cases. Sure, but obviously... Different assets, yep. a different asset but allocation. What, but, but we've heard, what, what's an example of something? Because there's been a lot of talk about fairness and your side's talking about it as well. You mentioned, for example, taxable income. For someone, obviously, in retirement phase, you could have $1.6 million in super. Be, and any your transfer balance is correct. all tax-free. So... So I'm just trying to step through the sort of example of where you go, here's the person, here are the assets, here's why it's unfair. Well, we can give you a thousand of them because they've all made submissions to the inquiry. I can give you the, the, the hands out from the week in Parliament. There are many cases mm. where people who have planned for their retirement done nothing wrong and actually now find they're going to lose eight, ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. Now, the average loss for one of those 900,000 individuals impacted upon Labor's policy. Don't forget they costed it. They costed it at a $55 billion tax grab. Mm. That's their number. Uh, their average loss is $2,200. If you're in a self-managed super fund, your average loss is $12,000. Now, if you go back to the Labor Party's tax policy in 1998, before this policy actually came in, they made the very point they made the very point that this would complete the imputation system, that this was a good thing, this would help retirees and those on low income earners. So the Labor Party's own words mm. have said that this is good policy. We now know that they are feeling the heat from people in their own constituencies about this very badly designed policy that will hurt pensioners, mm. that will hurt women, that will hurt low income earners. In terms of um, who it affects, obviously at the moment if you've got a couple on the uh, pension, the qualification ends at assets of $848,000. So we're not talking about people with nothing here, are we? Well, in the case of some people, they have low incomes uh, and also not a lot of assets. The issue here is but, that... But just on that point, when you say not a lot of assets, that's in that situation, a couple with their own home can still have $848,000 of assets and qualify for the part pension. So those people and everyone below that would all still get the refund under Well, look, there's a range of circumstances, Tom, but the fact is these people do not consider themselves wealthy and are not wealthy. They're, these are teachers, these are nurses. These are people who've done nothing wrong except diligently plan for their retirement. Mm. Now, if you think that it's welfare for the wealthy, as the Labor Party said, well, then go and speak to these people and actually understand their own individual circumstances. We've had Chris Bowen boasting on the 730 report that he wouldn't change his policy. Uh, now we know that they won't. And we've also had Chris Bowen arrogantly dismissed the concerns of over one million Australians who will be affected by this policy. It's not the right policy. Finally and briefly, Julie Bishop, 
big loss to the party? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Julie has been an outstanding member for Curtin, uh, an outstanding foreign minister. Uh, one of her great legacies will be the new Colombo plan, uh, which was based on the Menzies era initiative where thousands of people came from Asia to Australia and got experience here learning and studying. Um, now thousands of young Australians are going into the region working and studying. I think that's a great legacy. Mm. The great empathy that she showed, Tom, after the downing of MH17 with the families of those victims uh, was great leadership. Uh, she's been the deputy leader of the party for 11 years and I I think she served with great dignity and distinction and she leaves on a high. Treasurer Josh Rodenberg, thanks very much for your time. Good to be with you.